He is the host of Hardcore History, of course, our favorite history podcast. He's also a diehard Colorado Buffaloes fan who is gracious enough to come back here yes. for a second tour of duty. Pleased to welcome back to the Solid Verbal, Dan Carlin. Sir, how are you? <laughs> I'm well. Thanks for having me. A lot's changed since the last time we spoke. Yeah, I was going to say, so the last time we had you on, I think it was right after the news broke about USC and UCLA going to the Big Ten. We obviously talked about that and what it meant for college football fans as a whole. We had no way of knowing what would go down at Colorado. How are you dealing with all of this change in Boulder? Uh, I'm adjusting. Uh, but, you know, when you go 1-11, uh, uh, everything looks hopeful from the 1-11 uh, viewpoint. So so I'm very hopeful uh, is what I can say. It's really, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I, I'm not a very flashy guy. Uh, I'm one of those guys that likes to see the old-fashioned players who score a touchdown and hand the ball to the referee and all that. And that's not the game we have right now at Colorado. So I'm trying to adjust to a different sort of uh, amount of flashiness and, uh, and energy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I haven't had good reason to be hopeful in a while, so I'm enjoying that side of it. So exciting and hopeful. Hey, real quick, thanks for stopping by. Now would be a terrific time to subscribe to the Solid Verbal for college football videos all season long. So it says it right in your podcast description. You're a guy who prides himself on unorthodox thinking. How would you grade out the unorthodox methods of Coach Prime so far? Well, you know, it's funny because, I mean, we all come from an era where what he just did in terms of overhauling the roster wouldn't have even been possible. So so try, when you talk about unorthodox thinking, this is unorthodox thinking on his part and on, on in terms of the rules. I mean, the fact that you can do this and you may not be able to do this in the very near future. This is a, a narrow window where something like this is possible. Um, but when you bring on, I think it's something like 70 new players, uh, that's a complete transformation. And I know that USC and Oklahoma and some other schools have done, let's call it a lighter version of this last year. So it's not totally unprecedented, but it's going to be very interesting to see all the questions that get answered. Because when I read people who are critical of this, they'll talk about how long it might take to get these new players to gel and all that sort of stuff. But But here's the way I look at it. God bless the people we had on the team when we were 1-11, and 11, but this is a huge talent upgrade. So I can't see this as anything other than a net positive. Now, maybe they don't gel. Maybe these players left the teams that they were on for some good reason. But we have to be better than what we had. So that's the way I'm looking at it. How much are you consuming the Colorado football offseason experience? Are you on social media? Are you watching behind the scenes YouTube videos? Are you finding yourself charmed by Deion Sanders? What what is your level of uh, let's say consumption commitment to the Colorado football experience? Yeah, I listen, even when we're 1 and 11, I'm over consuming uh, all of the, all of the media and and hype and everything. Uh, but I have to say, the funny thing about the Deion Sanders thing, if I can if I can back up and sort of analyze sure. myself from afar, is that he's a lot more likable when he's your coach. You know, it's yes. like the, it's all of a sudden you kind of see the charm that maybe isn't so apparent when he's on the other sidelines or, or you know on the other team. Um, so I'm beginning to, I'm beginning to get the Deion Sanders charm a little bit more than I did uh, looking at him when he was a Florida State player or a Dallas Cowboy player or a 49er player or an Atlanta Falcons player. So uh, so yeah, and I'm I'm always consuming the stuff. There's obviously with. Uh, with all of the in-house media that he's brought, including his son doing a lot of the videos, there's more than ever to consume. Mm -hmm. But you're talking to a guy that back in the days before the Internet was subscribing to the newspapers they used to send to your house once a week. You know, So, <laughs> yeah. so I have a long history of over-consuming and making my family think I'm crazy. So Colorado leaves the Pac-12, and we'll get into realignment, I'm sure, more in a bit, but they leave the Pac-12. Was this something that you were following in terms of, oh, the Pac-12 is still looking for a new TV deal as other conferences are growing, as the Big 12 is growing, as the Big 10 is growing. Were you a proponent as somebody who, uh, you've already mentioned it today and you talked about it uh, the last time you were on the show, that you know you, you bemoan the loss of Colorado, Nebraska every season and bemoan the loss of certain matchups and rivalries that Colorado was involved with. Were you done with the Pac-12 when all of the, the rumors began swirling. Where were you before, during, and now with Colorado's move? 
Well, like many Pac-12 members, I was paying attention because I was worried. You know, once right. UCLA and USC bolt, that's the Los Angeles market. Uh, it was already a conference that was considered to be weaker than a lot of the other big conferences. So the last thing you want a potentially weak conference to do is lose two of their best members. Uh, so, yeah, like everybody, I think we were worried. And I think you get this sneaking feeling. I don't think people in the Big Ten get it. I don't think people in the SEC get it. But other conferences have this feeling like, OK, the game of musical chairs has started again. And is there going to be a chair to sit on for my team when the music stops? So, yes, I was paying attention. Now, um, in terms of what I wanted to have happen, well, when Colorado moved to the Pac-12 from the Big 12, it was sort of a nice uh, novelty for me. I grew up in Southern California, so that's Pac-12. 10 country when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And so it seemed kind of fun to play a bunch of West Coast teams that I grew up watching. Um, I think after a while you get tired of some of the teams you've been playing, although not Nebraska and Oklahoma and teams like that. But Nebraska was leaving too, so that, that option wasn't going to be available anyway. Right. So it seemed like a fun difference. It just happened to correspond to a time when Colorado football was suffering its worst stretch in the history of the of the program, which is over 100 years. Uh, so that didn't work out very well for us. Going back, you know, if we were going back to the same conference we left, right, Nebraska, Oklahoma, um, those sorts of teams, I'd be very excited because I miss all those rivalries, all the history. Uh, and you can say we have a long history with Iowa State and Kansas State and Kansas, and we do, but it's not like Nebraska and Oklahoma and Doesn't Missouri get you out of bed in the same teams. way. Yeah. Not in the same well, listen, nothing gets me out of bed like Nebraska. Um, right. <laughs> but but uh so so I'm I, in another sense though, there's a part of me that thinks in a way maybe Colorado belongs in that part of the country in a conference, and I do know that uh, there's a, a lot of people who feel like part of the reason Colorado hasn't been able to crawl out of the hole we've been in in the last 20 years is because the normal recruiting grounds where when Colorado is good, we recruit well, like Texas, has kind of been hard to recruit when you're not playing in Texas. So some of this seems to be going back to uh, to sort of a recipe that works for Colorado traditionally. Now, whether it'll work in the future, I don't know, uh, but it's sort of a return to the past for us, and the past looks better than the present, so I'm going to go with that. Are there specific opponents? Uh, you, nobody gets you out of bed like Nebraska. Are there any opponents? You mentioned Kansas State, Iowa State, and now you look at a conference without Texas and Oklahoma but has added Houston and UCF and BYU and Cincinnati. Is there anybody that Colorado doesn't have a history with? where you say to yourself, that's interesting. I'm curious about that. I'm curious about being in a conference with this team. Hmm. Uh, well, BYU, I think, okay. it would be kind of fun. Um, and we played BYU in the Freedom Bowl in, like, 1986 or 1987. I think Ty Detmer was the quarterback. I was at that game in Anaheim. Um, so that that was a that was an interesting uh, that could be a fun rivalry I sure. think um, and Houston for some reason uh, seems interesting to me and we played Houston I think in the early seventies in something like the Blue Bonnet Bowl or one of those kind of <laughs> things uh, so so that's kind of interesting I have really and you know I'm going to say this now and then we'll develop some rivalry that goes on forever but I have no real interest in Central Florida or Cincinnati or anything like that but but we'll see how it goes um, I think also let's be honest these are good programs. Uh, compared to what people might normally think of them as. But I mm -hmm. do think it's probably going to be a bit easier for Colorado to play those schools than some of the ones we've been playing, although we're moving with Utah, who's a nightmare, let's yep. be honest, uh, and Arizona and Arizona State. So it's it's not like we're coming to a conference with a whole bunch of teams that we can beat because we haven't beat Utah, Arizona, and Arizona State, and they're coming with us. So uh, so I don't know. I, I, at this point, like I said, this all goes back to 1-11. and 11. Uh, Change just looks good no matter what it is at this point as far as I'm concerned. And having a conference and a media deal – uh, and a place to land now that the musical chairs music has stopped is, is fantastic any way you slice it. You, Dan, you could be Stanford, you know? True, <laughs> true. Or Cal. <laughs> if, if you're putting on your other history buff hat, doing what you normally do on hardcore history, is there a historical event that you've covered, a historical figure that you've covered, something in that vein that roughly equates to Colorado leaving the Big 12 and then rejoining the Big 12, what is it, a decade plus later? Oh, I don't know. I mean, in a geopolitical sense, I think you'd have to think of countries falling apart and then going back to the to the motherland or whatever. I, I can't think of any. I, you know, I do think in terms of, like, 
historical analogies when it comes to sports. I mean, I can see things like that. Uh, although, you know, it's funny because conferences break up, right? You had the old Southwest Conference, for example, but you don't see people going back, you know, right. to where they were. And a lot of times you don't see them going back because the place where they were before is gone. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think that's part of what makes this a little unusual is that, you know, nor I mean, I can't see us leaving the Pac-12 if there hadn't been problems there. And then to go back to where we came from, no, to be honest, I don't see a historical analogy, nor do I see a, a sporting analogy, really. I'm sure I'm missing one, and one of your listeners will come up with one with an email after we're done, but I actually don't see it. This is pretty unprecedented, and I think that mirrors the fact that what we're seeing in college football and the realignment and the conferences and the impact of the TV money and the NCAA just sort of becoming in, inept and... um impotent at the same time all of this is like a perfect storm putting us into sort of uncharted territory well and and i kind of wanted to pivot off that a little bit because i know you did an episode a couple years ago now titled the destroyer of worlds what happens if human beings can't handle their own weaponry am i comparing college football to nuclear war a little Um, what are you doing ty (laughs) a little i'm just wondering like does it feel like everyone's gotten a little bit too greedy like a little bit over their skis with chasing money and media deals and the like. Are there any cautionary tales or any thoughts that float around in your mind as somebody who follows history and obviously follows college football for, for where this could go next and you know how you see this grander thing of conference realignment shaking out in the long term? Well, I mean, there's there, there's two things that come to my mind. The first one is, is that you don't need this kind of money to field a college football team. Uh, But you might need this money to field a very good college football team. And I think part of the reason why is because of the competition between the schools, which has always existed. I mean, back in the day, uh, you know, it was competition with, you know, schools that had boosters giving jobs to players that didn't have to show up on the on the job side. I mean, there was always I mean, SMU got the death penalty for a reason. Right. There was always stuff going on. Um, I, I do think that. When you look at the future of of where college football is going, we're going to get to an interesting time here. I mean, you know, we can talk about the Big 12 being a wonderful place for Colorado to land, but that doesn't mean it's a wonderful place forever. They have a TV deal in place till, what, the 2030-2031 season. Mm -hmm. So what happens then? Right. Right. Is that it? Because to me, if you look at where this is going, there's a— and circumstances can change, but this looks to be like the TV networks have hit a limit here on how much they can pay and still make a profit, right? If that's the case, then it's very possible that the next deals that are offered, especially once you take the Big Ten and the SEC out of this, are going to be less than what these conferences have gotten before. And what happens when you're going backwards on an athletic department budget, right? I mean, it's one thing to say we're going to take less of an increase than we expected. It's another thing to say we're going to take $10 million less per school than we had last time. I mean, can you really downsize and have it all work? I mean, that's what Washington State and Oregon State are seeing right now. I mean, they have debt and budgets and stadiums and all kinds of things that they have to try to manage with almost certainly less money than they, than they thought they were going to have. Well, what happens when that's not just, you know, Washington State and Oregon State's problem? What happens when that's the problem of everybody outside the big two conferences? What happens if the ACC finally eventually re-ups the the deal that they have and they don't get as much as they got this time, which they're not happy with? So, I mean, I think the interesting thing is going to be is is and we all understand that that live sports is the one of the really few areas where linear television can still get you to watch live, right, and watch the commercials and not tape it. And so, I mean, that's going to be one of those things where you say, okay, so it's still the cash cow. It's the only golden, you know, goose that they have right now. But what happens when they've maxed out the amount that they can pay and still recoup a profit? Uh, And I think, you know, the interesting thing here to me is the teams that have sort of fallen into the, the, the wonderful land of Oz here. I mean, everybody understands that if you're Michigan 
or if you're Alabama, I mean, that that you're going to get this kind of money and that your worth is to the TV networks. But my goodness, how did Vanderbilt and Rutgers right. and, and those schools got grandfathered into this thing? And, you know, if the TV networks could do it, they would boot the weaker schools and replace them with Florida State and Miami and those kinds of schools. But we haven't seen that happen yet. Right. You don't you can't go in and boot grandfathered schools. But what you can do is destroy a conference and then only take the best schools out of it. And then it's not your fault if Oregon State has no place to go. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, and and that's what I think worries me about what could happen next, because it's very popular online, especially to think of how all of the remaining teams that aren't in either the Big Ten or the SEC will eventually clump together into two Pangea conferences. But as you said, at some point, the cable networks are going to max out. They can't pay infinite amount of money. And so what worries me is when all these media deals are up, are we going to get to a point where TV stations and networks have even greater control and do exactly what you just described? They're going to Big Ten, they're going to the SEC, and they're saying, all right, we want these 10 teams. We want these 10 teams. We're going to create a Premier League. And whoever is left out is left out. You know, there's been talk about that. I don't know how real- realistic it is right now, but in the future, if this is just a continuing plight for more money, that's the only way I could see that anybody could pay more. Well, but it's like I said, the truth is you don't need this kind of money to field a football team, right? But you do if you need to have brand new athletic facilities every five years, if you need to be cutting edge and they have to have the, the high definition TV screens above every locker. If you, in other words, the things you need to woo the top players is what requires these schools to shell out the kind of money they do. Uh, it, it's not that's not what uniforms cost, right? That's not what right. travel budgets cost. That's not even what it costs to field the non-revenue teams, you know. Um, but that's what you need in order to to participate in the arms race for the top recruits. So that's sort of a different question. So if you have your Pangea League, for example, um, I, I, as long as you have a path for those schools to play in the national championship, I'm not sure there's not a way to sell that to the schools that already are mortgaging their future to try to compete in in the world where trying to be Oregon, for example, without a Phil Knight is really, right. I mean, you end up in debt. I mean, this is the problem that schools, I mean, look at what Cal's dealing with. Uh, Washington State's got real problems, but they've got those problems because they're trying to play with big boys that there might be a sort of a relief not having to. And then there's another way of looking at this. And I don't know how I feel about it, frankly, but I know you guys have probably talked about it too, which is there's a lot of people that feel like all of this is corrupting the college football that we love. And that if there's going to be, and I think we talked about this when we talked last time, if there's going to be an NFL light that develops out of this, right, with the top 24 or 5 programs or whatever you want to say when all the shakeup is over, is there a place where you could say that the rest of the teams then actually form something more like the college football that we used to appreciate? You know, can, can you maybe say that, Everybody doesn't have to play this game and there doesn't have to be winners and losers as much as there might just have to be separate categories. And Mm -hmm. the only problem is, and we talked about this the last time also, is that you definitely are killing the regionalism. You definitely are killing the old rivalries. And I can't speak for younger people who didn't grow up with these rivalries. But when we came to the Pac-12, Colorado, for example, and they try to make Utah our artificial enemy, we don't hate Utah. We don't have, you know, decades and decades of history with that. Right. There have been bloodbaths with Nebraska. There's, there's when I think I told you guys this story, but when I got to Colorado in 86, there were all these, for you young people, I might have to explain it, define it, Xeroxes that were Xeroxed onto every telephone pole and, and any anything that stood vertically uh, above ground on the Colorado campus that showed uh, a scene from the previous year's game against Nebraska, and it had two very, very large Nebraska players standing over what appeared to be a relatively small Colorado player who was clearly deathly injured with, like, his leg snapped or something, and they were standing above him laughing. And this was on, I mean, this was how you developed the hatred that mm-hmm. even now, when we don't play them for years and then we play them again, it's as though nothing left. That takes decades to really grow. And so if you move conferences around too much and you shatter the, the, 
the either the history or the developing hatred, well, then you kill something that that um, that makes something in college football, I think, unique. And, and, and I think we're going to miss that down the road. And maybe, you know, you brought up Destroyer of world, Worlds, and one of the things we had said there is, you know, if you had a gun pointed to your head from the time you're born, do you even know you have a gun pointed to your head? Well, if hmm. you've never experienced a real rivalry over the decades that it takes to really foster something like that, do you really miss it? I don't know. I miss well, Nebraska, though. So do you find yourself feeling romantic about the past more than you do hopeful for the future what where do you how do you square where we are with your own Colorado fandom and how do you I mean you talk about with you know teams spending like crazy taking wild financial swings to try to compete with the top Colorado's kind of trying to do that right now where where would you prefer Colorado be in that old sort of regional style that reforms in your mind or you know, continuing to swing, even though it seems on the surface kind of futile. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. That was something I had said to myself I should bring up, and then I forgot about it. So I'm glad you reminded me. But but what Deion Sanders is doing at Colorado, again, you know, the jury is still out on how this is going to turn out. But let's assume it's successful. Right. If it's successful, then what he is showing is how schools without a Phil Knight or without the sort of backing an Ohio State or an Alabama has, how they might pull this off, right? Because we, what what does uh, Deion Sanders say? He says, Colorado's got no bag. We have no bag for these players. Right. If you want a bag, you have to go elsewhere. But can they promise something else? Is there a way to offer subsidiary benefits that don't correspond to the things that we normally assume a player's after? Whether it's, um, you know, the hype, or the swag, or the uh, or or the cachet of playing for Deion Sanders, or this idea, you know, uh, he has this line. I'm going to try to remember it. Uh, if you play good, they pay good. Mm-hmm. I mean, is is it the idea that that stop trying to make all this money when you're in college? Come here, I'll make you a pro, and then you'll make tons of money. Um, so, are there other ways to set? Because again, all these facility upgrades and staying on the cutting edge of all the the cool stuff for the players is all part of getting a recruiting edge are there other ways to gain that recruiting edge without all that and I think that's what this Deion Sanders approach is an attempt to do to say we're never going to have what Alabama and Oregon have but we have something that they don't come here play for me I'll get you to the pros Uh, I have and I think you know it's never said but you feel like it's implied you know when he brings all these pros uh 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 who was it that was uh that was there this week uh uh top wide receiver uh shows up for the NFL you got these guys uh and who was it uh, it was the Denver Broncos working out with them the other day there's this implied thing like i know all these guys in the NFL play for me and i'll make a call right they'll know your name cuz i'll call them for you i that's not something that's advertised on the wall but you get this sense that there's the you know that that's the hidden advantage of coming to colorado now is there's no bag but deon sanders is going to make you know all the connections for you one there's only deon there's only one deon sanders though right that like there, it's not a blueprint that can easily be replicated unless you go find the most charismatic players of the last you know 25 years and convince them to coach at your college that would i think be the counterpoint that it it would be hard for purdue or minnesota or oklahoma state or somebody like oklahoma state has money so that's not a good example but you know a, a smaller major program to replicate and two if it works isn't Dion gone isn't he leaving Colorado in that situation? Yeah, I, so so that's that's the big worry, is that if Deion Sanders is a horrible coach and, and we lose a ton, then this was a bad thing. If Deion Sanders is a fantastic coach and leaves next year, then this was probably – I can't say it's a bad thing because, again, 1-11, right? In 11, right? Sure. But uh-huh. but it, it's not optimal. Um, you know, here's what you hope. And again, you asked earlier whether I'm watching all of the materials and the hype and everything, and I am. Right. Yeah. He has. So I guess he's a great fisherman. He's really enjoying Boulder. He bought mm-hmm. a house that's got a stream behind his house that has these huge fish in it. Uh, you you know what you kind of hope is that if he can win at Colorado, and you can win at Colorado, sure. Um, then maybe you find the lifestyle's wonderful, and there's no reason to leave. I just there was a story out yesterday that Colorado just beat. Uh, all of its previous records, at least for the last decade, on the amount of money donated to the athletic department this last year. Well, that's all from Deion Sanders, too. So theoretically, I mean, 
Could we pay him as much as any other team out there? I don't think we could. But again, and this is almost the Deion Sanders philosophy working on Deion Sanders, but could we make his life good enough in so many other respects that when you take it all holistically, you'd rather win there than elsewhere? And let's be honest, there's another aspect here that I think Oregon and uh, Washington are going to find out to their detriment when they go to the Big Ten. This is not going to be as tough of a conference to get to the playoffs in. And there's an advantage there, too. Um, or, you know, there's the real possibility that Oregon's going to find themselves, you know, I'll probably eat my words here, but going 6-6 six and six a lot of the years in the in the Big Ten. And a team like Nebraska, who's already struggling, what are they going to do with USC, UCLA, uh, Oregon, and Washington now probably in whatever division they end up in? Life just got tougher for those schools. Life just got easier for Deion Sanders and the Colorado Buffaloes. That's true. So what what is your interest now so you grew up in Southern California. You, I, I remember you live in Eugene, Oregon, or you used to live in Eugene, Oregon. I, I do. I, I've lived yeah. here a long time now. Yeah. Yeah. So you are familiar with West Coast football. I went to Oregon. I'm from Southern California. And so there is definitely a part of me as somebody who grew up watching all of these West, school, West Coast schools play each other that is sad, is wistful, because what we're now seeing is this sort of mega conference coming together and I don't feel anything about Wisconsin even though Oregon played Wisconsin in the Rose Bowl I don't feel anything about Oregon playing Northwestern or Minnesota or Ohio State played the Rutgers. Ohio State Rutgers Maryland all of these places and so I'm starting at square one as an Oregon fan as I'm sure and Oregon will play you know Washington USC UCLA so there's the the connectivity there but will you watch a new look Big 10 knowing that you don't necessarily have feelings about a lot of these matchups, even though you have that that geographic connective tissue. Well, you know, I don't know. I think what you're saying, though, holds a lot of weight. I mean, the idea that you could have a more than a 100-year-old uh, college conference just disappear overnight is upsetting. I mean, you, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know what to, I mean. Look, it's one thing if you have conferences that have been on shaky ground for a long time, uh, maybe only interest locally. But I mean, the Pac-10, Pac-12, Pac-8 back when I was a kid, that's a historic conference. I mean, the, the Rose Bowl with the Pac-12, Pac-10 and the Big Ten. I mean, th these are foundational entities in college football. I mean, if the SEC went away tomorrow, what would that mean? Or if the Big Ten went away tomorrow, what would that? I mean, it's it's hard to square that with a sport who's you know one of the things that they sell the most when they talk about it is tradition, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the Conference of Champions, all that sort of hype. Uh, no, it's hard to square, and and I do think that, you know, I, I was joking with a friend the other day. I think we're one step away. There's only one thing that the pros do that college doesn't do yet. And we maybe, you know, we were playing around with the idea because it's kind of a funky idea. But why does the University of Oregon even have to play in Eugene anymore? I mean, why can't it be the University of Oregon Ducks in Las Vegas, right? The Las right. Vegas Ducks representing the University of Oregon. I mean, that's the one last holdover is that these, right. these teams are actually still tied to the institutions. But somebody might turn around one day and go, well, you know, if Oregon can't get enough money here to compete, there are a lot of other towns that would pay for them, and they could still be the University of Oregon Ducks. They just wouldn't be in, you know, a tiny little town like Eugene. I mean, that's the, to me, that's the only difference between the NFL right now. NFL teams can move, college teams can't, but whoever wrote that they can't. Are you for this? Are you no, okay. no, no. I'm not for what's already happened. Just if it was me, sure. I'd still be in the big eight. What are you talking about? <laughs> I like this. I'm just making sure. I'm just making sure. Is just doing a sense check. That's all. Yes. Um, no, I one of the, the terms I use is scar tissue as as an Oregon fan, you know, you everybody makes a big deal about the traditions and the uh the the rivalries that we lose. And my thing this whole time is I have a lot of scar tissue about Washington State, Arizona, Arizona State. I even remember a game, Colorado, if you can believe it, beat Oregon in the last decade. And Cal, Stanford, I was all at of these that schools, game, by the way. That when, was awesome. When Oregon was dressed up <laughs> as the duck when they were wearing the, the orange cleats. I have, I have to interrupt you and tell you a story about that Please. game, though, because to me, it embodies everything we're talking about in college football, right? Yes. Um, so, so Colorado has gone through these terrible years and it's been really tough for, for we Colorado fans. And so mm -hmm. I'm at that game with a bunch of Oregon fans 
And uh, and if you saw that game, Colorado won at the very last second. It was completely improbable. I don't know what the what the point spread was uh, in right. Vegas, but it was it it was never supposed to happen, right? So as we're walking out of the game, the entire Oregon crowd is stunned. But there's a few Colorado fans like yours truly in the crowd as we're walking out, and we were afraid to you know hoot and holler, right? Because yep. we're so badly outnumbered, but. All of a sudden, and I mean completely spontaneously, anyone who was wearing any Colorado gear or anything were, would hold their hands up above the crowd, and another Colorado fan would touch your hand. And just this sort of silent acknowledgement of, hey, something good happened to us. We did it. We're in hostile territory, but can you believe we won that game? And, I mean, this was completely voiceless, wordless, and everyone did it. And yes. I walked out of that and just said, where else does that happen? So, so when we talk about the specialness of that this sport, that to me is one of those moments where you just go, that was a special moment in a horrible era of Colorado football for me, and I don't think it would have happened had we been this powerhouse. It only happened because we had this shared moment of a victory in darkness, and only another Colorado fan that day knew what it meant. And we couldn't celebrate openly. We couldn't tear down the goalpost at a visiting stadium. Right. But we could have this silent moment of acknowledgement that, you know, we were in this together in this hostile place. And wasn't it awesome? You know, see, that's that's an interesting uh, point and observation. I've been in stadiums where Oregon fans were super outnumbered, you know, at USC, wherever. And Oregon is able to pull off an upset in hostile territory. But Oregon fans can get to USC. There are a ton of Oregon fans in Southern California. There are a ton of Washington fans along the West Coast. I wonder if it's going to be different when one of these West Coast schools plays, you know, Minnesota. Minnesota wouldn't be an upset, but Penn State or Michigan. And I think early on people will travel. I just wonder if the experience of seeing college football in person on the road changes with geography that you won't have as many acknowledge, silent acknowledgments after your team goes into a huge stadium and and pulls off an upset. I, I think the geography might play an issue there, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't see how it can't be an issue. I mean, first of all, if they do pods or I mean, when you're if, if, if Oregon is playing the two L.A. schools and Washington and then some schools in the Big Ten or whatever, I think I think you'll get just as much travel as you always did with the with the schools on the West Coast. And then sure. maybe your average Oregon fan will spring for a game here or a game there on the road. But it has to affect things, I would think. And uh, and you know what? Not just that. I do think that. Well, you know, I, I have a lot of friends who are Oregon fans, and they keep talking about uh, Oregon's record against some of these schools. We beat right. Michigan this year, or we beat Ohio State this year, and I keep saying, yes, but those are one-offs. Especially the way Oregon schedules, it's usually one marquee, really tough non-conference game sandwiched between two relatively winnable ones. And so you can get up for that. It's not like you're facing those kinds of offensive lines week after week after week. I think that's going to be telling when you have to do that in terms of injuries and depth. Here's the thing that's more interesting to me is with these West Coast schools going to the Big Ten with the weather, with the uh, style of ball and everything that those mm -hmm. teams play, are you going to start to see those teams look like Big Ten teams? I mean, once you've gone through a few recruiting cycles, do they start to resemble the Michigan State's and the Ohio States and the Iowas a little bit more. I'm I, I'm intrigued by that possibility. God, I hope they don't look like Iowa. I really, <laughs> I really, especially on offense, I can't handle that. See, I can. I want that. See, this is where we're different. Coming okay. from a Big Eight school, I want. If you go watch the 2001 game where Colorado destroyed the Nebraska program, uh, and and somehow killed ourselves in the same game. I don't know how that happened. Um, that's the style of football I want to play. Okay. Uh, and, and what's funny is it's it's very old fashioned. And I was reading somewhere that Nebraska's trying to go back to more. I mean, you know, this could be a, a bunch of hype, but that their new coach wants to go back to a fullback, two tight ends, that kind of thing, and see if that works. I, I'm really curious if that worked. I'd love to do that. It's it, but you know what? It's a stupid thing to do to go to an old style offense just because of nostalgia. Right. I mean, if that's the case, why not go to like you know the the flying V and all that kind of old stuff? You know. <laughs> I have to ask, since you've been talking so much smack on Nebraska, Dan, there is a game 
this year between Colorado and Nebraska. Do you have any plans to attend? I'm going. Yeah, I'm going. I could I couldn't get out of it. Somebody offered me free tickets, and then yeah, <laughs> and I said to my wife, I said I'm not going. I said I have to watch that game alone in a darkened <laughs> room on television with rewind and announcers and all this. And she said, No, 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 no. You're good. We're both going. If the, free tickets to a game that's hard to get tickets to. Yeah. Um, Nebraska's a hard game for me to watch, though, because uh, if you actually go look at the stats, you know, your your poor audience has been regaled with Colorado-centric discussion this whole conversation. But if you actually go and watch those games, the number of times that Nebraska has scored, either the very first time they touch the ball or in the first series, it, again, this is how rivalries are made, right? Mm-hmm. This is where you develop, like you had talked about, scars. This is how scars are formed, and the scars are what really... You know, what's that old line from one of the superhero movies? Our scars are what make us who we are. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, And that's how these programs develop the sort of feels that they have. And so I don't even want to be at the stadium. I, and I told my wife, she said, we're going. And I said, great. So what do we do if Nebraska kills us? It's going to be a lot of fun to be at the stadium live when that <laughs> happens. So, uh, yes, I'll be at the game, uh, apparently. Do you have a, and, a single piece of red clothing? You strike me as somebody who might not because of Nebraska. It's funny you say that. So I'm wearing a pair of, of red red athletic shorts right now. Wow. And my wife and, and wait, and my wife and my daughter looked at me today and said, I don't think I've ever seen you in red. So it's it's like the first time ever. I was gonna ask, do you have any antics when you're watching Colorado football? Like if you're alone in the darkened room? Because I, I know Dan and I do. Yeah. Um uh, yes, I'm usually on message boards at the same time, and not <laughs> okay. just mine. I'll be on Nebraska's at the same time, right? I'll be reading both sides' wow. comments about every play. Yeah, well, you know, I have a problem. No, this is great. So, <laughs> but are you a are you a silent viewer, stewing when you're upset? Are you a yeller? Have you broken remotes? What is what is the physical reputation that you have watching Colorado football? It's. Uh, you know, again, uh, you have to make a distinction between watching Colorado football and watching the Nebraska game. Right. Mm. Uh, n- normally, I'm a very quiet sort of passive observer, uh, especially, you know, the last few years have given me nothing to get excited about. I mean, you just kind of get, you know, you resign yourself. But Nebraska's different. Uh, and I have to say, even with these down years, we've beaten Nebraska the last couple of times we played them. I believe this game this year is going to, because I think our record in the 21st century is even, Either this one evens it up, or this will put Colorado ahead. One or the other. So for this game, yes, I throw things, I scream and yell, and it's the it's completely out of character too. I mean, it, it is once again a bizarre testimonial to what the sport can do to us with the passion and the excitement and the history and all that kind of stuff. It's a it it's the let's put it this way: I'm down to one sport, and this <laughs> wow. is it. And if they screw this one up for me, I got nothing else. So what what now? Right now, you have the the Nebraska game coming up. Are you going to be watching the sport in its entirety? Has that has anything changed with this off season with the movement of the sport? How how are you adjusting? I know you have your the things that excite you, the things that worry you. How do you plan on consuming the sport overall next year and beyond? Well, it's weird for my family because I obviously went to see you, but my wife went to Washington State. Her whole family went to Oregon State. Okay. So uh, as her brother told me recently, Oregon State doesn't even know who they're playing next year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, try to imagine what that looks like. They don't even know who they're playing once conference schedules start. So, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for the programs that don't have a home right now. And we can talk all day long about, you know, we'll just go into the Mountain West or just reform the Pac-12, but it's easier said than done. And if the money's not there, uh, I guess you should be glad that there's a route to the championship game somehow, but it's going to be a... Look, as I told my brother-in-law... Colorado is just in a in a more delayed version of what Oregon State has because when that Big Twelve TV deal comes up for renewal, it could be the same situation all over again. I mean, I don't think the TV networks are going to be really excited about re-upping your Texas Tech, Central Florida. Uh, uh, you, you know, I mean, it's no no offense to those teams, but it's not Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama. You know, uh, it, it's just a different story once you're not one of those have programs. It, um, and so I'm going to be watching the last year of the Pac-12 is the way I look at it and try to enjoy, uh, you know, a hundred and some year old conference play its last year. In, and, and ironically enough, it could be one of the best years in conference history, if yep. you look at on the on paper anyway. 
And then I think I'm going to watch the year after that to see what the new world looks like. And I'll always watch CU football. Um, but so so there's a little curiosity about what the first year in the Big Ten means to all those Pac-12, formerly Pac-12 teams, and what I don't know what the first year in the Mountain West or the reformed Pac-12 looks like right. for um, the schools that that stand by. And look, let's be honest. What's going to happen with the ACC? I think I, that's the next big question to for everybody to wonder about because if Clemson and Miami and Florida State uh, go away, I mean, you know, uh, then what do you have? Le- I mean, goodness gracious. So uh, here's your platform. Here is your opportunity. Deep Colorado. What do you believe is – I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question. I just want to give you a platform to give you your your Colorado thoughts at the moment. I think the the general consensus at the moment is they have interesting skill players. They have speed on defense. The good corners in uh, – or great corners potentially in Cormani McLean and Travis Hunter. An intriguing quarterback prospect who hasn't faced big-time defenses in Shadur Sanders – what do you think people have right and wrong about either gelling or where the talent is? It's hard to sort of know because none of these guys have played together, it seems. So what is your general outlook in the the short term with Colorado football this season? What are you expecting to see on the field? Well, let me apologize to your audience once again for a completely Colorado-centric <laughs> program today. But but I'll give you the rundown. Uh, okay. I, I can give you some – so quarterback – Feel however you want about Shadur Sanders. Colorado does not traditionally have good quarterbacks. I can count the good quarterbacks at Colorado on one hand, and even the ones that graded on a curve look good to us are not that great. Cordell Stewart, Darian Hagan are the best quarterbacks I ever saw at Colorado. Uh, Coy Detman was probably the best pure passer at Colorado. And while I love those guys, they're not Peyton Manning. Right. right? Um, so so this is the best quarterback Colorado's had in a very long time. He may be the best quarterback Colorado's ever had. Wow. Uh, and it doesn't take that oh, much man. to be to be the best we've ever had. We're a running back school when it comes to offense. Right. And an sure. offensive line school um, running back. I don't know how to grade the running backs yet because uh, 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 the guy who's uh, McCaskill, who's coming off a, a terrible knee injury. Houston. Yeah. Uh, and he still seems a little fragile. So we'll see. See, uh, Cavassier Smoke from Kentucky. I don't know what to think of him yet. Um, Dylan Edwards, the guy we stole from Notre Dame, is mm-hmm. fast as lightning. Um, I'm happy to have somebody who's fast as lightning. Um, so we'll see. I'm glad to have him out there. The offensive line, I, I don't trust the offensive line yet. Got my fingers crossed. Uh, but I think the skill players on offense are the best we've had in a long time. And the wide receivers are maybe better than any we've ever had as a group. Um, wow. So uh, It was so pretty Shadur, good a few years ago with LaVisca yeah, Chenault and Katie Nixon. They had a couple of dudes. Oh, you, but you think back in my day it was uh, like Charles Johnson. Sure, and, yeah. And, and, yeah. I mean, the guys, guys uh, uh, we, we had some great guys back in the day but but this is a lot of depth to go along sure. with the skill um we'll see how tight end pans out uh, i don't know if i believe some of the hype coming out of the camp but we'll see uh, defense is a different question Tyler. the dbs are fantastic i think yes. you're gonna have a i think i think that's gonna allow uh the defensive coordinator to do some interesting things to cover up holes I- that we might have uh don't know about the linebackers uh these are supposedly good players we'll see uh, the edge is going to be good. The interior, I don't know about. But once again, if your DBs are really rock solid and really good, you can cover up some of those holes maybe. Uh, we might have to outscore some people, uh, and depending on how the offensive line turns out, we'll see how that happens. But as I said, coming from 1 to 11, I don't know how you're not just completely jacked. And and, and they may call Deion Sanders a failure if we go you know, 6-6 six and six or something like that. But that's a oh, huge victory. That's we, a huge season. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Look He'd at be the, coach and look of the at year the, at 6-6. Six and, and six. look at the schedule. I mean, with the schedule the Buffs have this year, if we yeah. go 6-6, six to six, I don't know how you're not happy as a Buff fan, no matter how much he, Kool-Aid you're drinking. Oh, yeah. He'd be national coach of the year. Six yeah. and six. Oh, yeah, that scares me, right? So you don't know how to, you don't know how many victories you want <laughs> Dion to have, right? Uh, right. If he, if he has a super great season, we may lose him. So, but but here's the thing: coming from one and eleven, even if you go six and six, he builds up all of this national attention on Colorado football again, where, right. which has not been there. That's a net positive. Even if he leaves after a year, if he yeah, gets yeah, anything going so. in a good direction. You know, I think maybe I mean, the coach you can that. get after him, too, might be better than you could have hoped for. Other, I mean, when you raise the profile of the program, because here's the problem, and you guys know this and your whole audience knows it, too. The memory of these people you're trying to recruit is probably eight to ten years long. So if you yeah. haven't been good in eight or ten years, 
it doesn't matter how long those of us who have long memories of a program's history matter, right? So what Deion Sanders is doing is is raising the profile in the minds of these young people in a way that puts Colorado at least on the radar for, for their short-term memory here. So that even if he leaves you'll have more to build on than you otherwise would. And if you and if he's leaving because of success, all the better. So uh, that's why I think this is one of those hires that was a no-lose hire for us, no matter what happens. Have you, and be honest here, have you written more than 1,000 words at a time on a message board? Oh, no, people hate that. You can't do that. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> but, but, but you can write four or five posts in quick succession. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Use it like Twitter. He right? understands right. his you, universe. Yeah, yeah, three or four 250-word <laughs> posts in, in quick succession. <laughs> I appreciate that. Oh, man. That. Dan Carlin, Hardcore History. What can we promote for you? What have you been up to? Nothing. Just, you know, you do the shows. Uh, that, uh, uh, love it if people like the work. I, I like talking college football. You guys do a great job. You ask great questions. And uh, as always, I hope I hope we don't bore your audience to tears. That's all. No, they'll love it. Here, here's what we're going to do, Dan. We're going to give you our phone number, our voicemail line, that you can call into after that Colorado-Nebraska game and give us a real-time raw reaction. And we'll play. No, it we'll we'll see. It depends on how things go. <laughs> depends. It it's a way. qualified. Yes, qualified I don't offer. need to be on your show having it all rubbed in, you know. <laughs> so we'll see. Here's uh, Dan you know, you, sobbing. It, yeah, guys. It, what, what we're gonna know it. We're gonna know a lot more clearly after the first game. Because that's the problem, yes. is that we are a complete unknown, right? We can be awful, we could be great, we could be anywhere in between, and we have no idea. When you've got 70 new players, all new coaches. We have no the offense. I mean, everything is completely unknown. So we'll know more after the first game. And uh, and you know what? I mean, you almost think you kind of want to lose just barely to TCU. Have a chip on your shoulder. Have the first game at home for Deion Sanders running behind the Buffalo or scootering behind the Buffalo or whatever he's going to be doing. And then you know, hopefully, do real well against the rivals and tear the goalpost down. So so we'll see. But I have no idea what to expect. I'm just a, I have a ton of curiosity like the rest of you. Awesome. Well, we appreciate your time as always. We'll we'll keep in touch this season. It's going to be interesting to say the least for a Colorado fan. Dan Carlin, Hardcore History. Thank you again. We'll have you back on at some Thanks point. Thanks for soon. having me on, guys. As usual, appreciate it. Thank you so much.